This morning we come and we look at Paul, the slave apostle, and he is writing for the sake of God's elect. Paul, the slave apostle, writing for this, the sake of God's elect. We have started the study of Titus. If you're new to us, notice the title of the whole series. It's Titus, Right Doctrine, Right Leaders, and Right Living. This little, very, very short letter of the New Testament is very powerful and very pertinent for us in this day and time. We've noticed that the introduction to this letter is action-packed. In fact, we've preached three sermons so far, and we've only gotten past the first about eight or nine words. This morning, believe it or not, we're going to make it into verse two, and in fact, um, finish ver most of verse two. So uh, notice with me the box on the page, and uh, I want you to notice this. This is our text for the message, and you're going to see some very powerful concepts that are right here. Paul is writing, and he's writing to Timothy. In verse one, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, and here it is, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, verse 2, in hope of what? Well, in hope of what? Eternal life. We've just been singing about that. Which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. And at the proper time, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Verse 4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. We've said that this introduction is kind of long. It's not the longest introduction of a New Testament letter. In fact, Romans and Galatians, those introductions are longer. But this is a pretty power-packed introduction, and in it, he tells us what the big picture is, and we're going to see that this morning. Um, but notice here with me in our review, the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus, giving him some key instructions, and this is really important. Over the next few months, we're going to see all of these things played out um, as we study the book of Titus. I want to encourage you to be reading it, but there's some key things that he's bringing up. Number one, he's bringing up false teachers. You say, wow, false teachers again. This comes up a lot. Jesus spoke of it. Peter spoke of it. Jude spoke of it. Paul is speaking of it. False teachers. You remember with me that the greatest false teacher is who? Satan. He, he is the father of lies. And he wages war against the image of God. He wages war against the truth of God. And he... He infiltrates the church very often with false teachers. That's not just something in this present day. That's something that's been going on for 2,000 years. And so, because of those false teachers, he's, he's dealing with the doctrinal problems that come up. It's, it's, he's dealing with the things that are, that are not right, that are being taught to the churches in Crete. And as a result of that, they see very clearly the need to appoint qualified elders or leaders. And it's not just any leader, but we see here in Titus and we also see in Timothy a list of qualifications. So leadership goes with the quality of their doctrine. Leadership goes with the quality of their doctrine and, as we see, the way that they live. And then the last one that we will see is something that just over and over again comes up. It's that Christian living, uh, he's per writing pertaining to Christian living amidst a culture of great ungodliness. So can we relate to that or what? We're called to be Christians and we live in a world, we live in a culture of great ungodliness. All around us we see the ungodliness that is here. And we are called to live differently. We are called to live by God's truth and with his love, and we are called to have that redeeming love that is going out to the world that's all around us. Now, many of you thought that these bags that are up here are just kind of um, uh, Valentine's uh, decorations of some sort, and I guess to a degree they are. But it's interesting that in the life of our church, that God just lays it on, a, on, on different members of the church um, to do different types of outreach, to be a blessing to people in different ways. And if several years ago, God began to lay on Cassandra Brown and Alondra, there, and it just this beautiful ministry that their family can have to, to ladies that have been sucked into the 
the trouble of prostitution and have become prostitutes here in Broward County. And so these ladies begin to have a vision for how can we, in the midst of the ungodliness in our culture around us, how in the midst of all of the darkness and all of the trouble and all of the hardship and all of the sin, how can we seek to proclaim Christ with love? And so they started to say, well, let's see if when on one of the big nights of the year when prostitutes are taken advantage of and when prostitutes are, are doing their thing, can we not show them the love of Christ? And so these ladies began to put together bags with um, Bibles and with tracts and with hairbrush and with cosmetics and with some other things that are there and with a letter and a card of love saying that Christ loves you. And if you will come to him, he will save you out of all of your trouble. And so this Wednesday night, they will take these bags and they will go into the areas where prostitutes are standing on the corners and th prostitutes are there seeking to do this in the midst of all of their sin, in the midst of all of their bondage. Listen, in the midst of all of their rejection, there will be some ladies that come up with a gift and seek to love them and show them the love of Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul is writing to a very, very tight-knit church that is in a, a very ungodly place. The island of Crete was filled with liars. It was filled with sensuality. It was filled with deception. It was filled with all kinds of rampant evil. This was a hard place to be a Christian. This was a hard place to have a healthy church. And so Paul is writing to somebody who has been left behind to help those churches become strong. He's writing to Titus, and he's helping them in that way. Number two, notice this, the overall theme of Titus is the inseparable link between faith and practice. You see, this isn't just a message for a pastor. This is a message for you and for me right here in 2018 in South Florida in our Christian lives. Not only faith and practice, but we see this idea similarly to belief and behavior. That's another way to say it. That he's saying, you say that you believe this, but do you live it? Does it affect the way you, you live your life at work? Does it affect the way you live your life at home? Does it affect your finances? Does it, does it affect your conversations? Does it affect your relationships, your morality? Does the Christian gospel of God's grace affect the way you live? And so what he's calling the churches to are these three things. You remember them with me. The first one is right what? Do you remember what it was? Right doctrine. He's saying you... you, you the overall picture, and this is part of what we see right here, is the right doctrine and belief. And then he goes to the picture of right leaders. If you have the wrong leaders, you're not going to have the right doctrine. Doctrine is going to be preached by the right leaders. And then we see not only that, but right living. He really deals with the way we live our lives. He really deals with our obedience to the truth. Now, I have a little point here, number three, that, that I believe is important, and, I, and I've been reflecting on this a little bit since I've been putting together the time here, and I think you'll see why I, why I offer it to us this morning. Look at number three. Paul writes this between the years 63 and 65 AD, and this is not long before he is executed. So Paul is executed and, and not long before that, he's writing, and he writes to Timothy, and he writes to Titus. Now, he wrote a lot of things toward the end, but especially Timothy and Titus. And I want you to see this. Paul and Titus, and we know this from, from references uh, in other letters, Paul and Titus have known one another for about 20 years at this point. For 20 years, they've been friends in the ministry. For 20 years, they have been traveling, they have been planting churches, they have been discipling people, they have been pastoring. 
And so as Paul writes this letter, he's writing to a friend in the faith. In fact, he calls him my true child in a common faith. And so there's this mentor-mentee relationship with it where Paul is pouring, and, and we see in this, he, we, we see his his leadership over Titus' life and his emphatic nature where he says some things that are very dogmatic. He says, pay attention, pay careful attention to this, Titus. You have to get a hold of this in the churches. Otherwise, they are not going to honor God. And so, vastly important, similar circumstances that we live in, many false teachers have risen up even in this, dec- in this decade, and much ungodliness that is all around us that has even affected the church. So this morning we, we come to where he now tells us, and not just Paul, the, we, we looked at him as the slave and the apostle, and you see that in verse one, the servant of God, really that is doulos, should be slave of God, and the messenger or the apostle, the sent one of Jesus Christ, but now we come to the reason for it. Now, I've been thinking about this as well. Um, in our day, this is, this is so cool how it, how it, we do the same thing still um, as, as we see in this letterhead. Um, so here's the beginning of the letter. When you receive a memo, either at work or at home or something like that, when you receive an email, the same stuff is going on at the top of the letter. And I want you to notice this. Um, the RE, what does RE stand for? Regarding or reference, right? And, and there you see it there. Or in, in the top of your email list, it says subject, right? Well, look at verse 1. It says, Paul, an, an apostle of God, and a, excuse me, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith. This is the RE. This is regarding This is the subject. He's saying, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. He's saying, this is what I'm writing to you about. I'm writing about the faith of God's people. I'm writing to you about the the way that they, excuse me, the knowledge that they have, their doctrine, what they understand. I'm writing to you about their holiness because this faith is to go with, with their godliness. This doctrine is to result in them living not like the rest of Crete, but living like Christians in Crete. And then he goes on to say that he's writing to remind them and to show them of the eternal life that there is in Christ. So n- notice these. The, we see in this little verse 1 and 2 a threefold foundational concern or motivation of Paul's letter. Here we get to see what this is all about. And the first one is evangelism. He's saying, I'm an apostle that's called to preach the gospel, and we're planting churches. And you know what churches are supposed to do? They're supposed to tell people that a Savior has died so that those who are called can hear the truth and respond to the truth. This is about evangelism. Look what it says, for the faith of God's elect. And you notice there, and by the way, very often when we preach here, if you haven't noticed this, I want you to notice it. Next to number one, where it says, I've asked you to fill in evangelism there, you see the words in italics. That's from the verse we are studying. Number two, you see words in italics. Number three, you see words in italics. We want to see what that means. Well, the first hint that we get about what that means is we see the word, it's for the sake of, or regarding, the faith of God's elect. This is Are they going to believe? And the picture is, Paul would say, if you read all of his theology, yes, they're going to believe. And they're going to believe because the gospel is preached to them. And when they hear the gospel, they're going to respond to it. And so our goal and our job is to preach the gospel so that God's people can respond to it. Now, this gospel is preached to all mankind. But notice what it says. Paul is right. He writes and he works, fill this in, to help bring God's elect to saving faith in Jesus. He's preaching and he's writing. He's working with Titus so that all of those that are going to believe can believe by coming to the saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we're going to see how this fits together in just a minute. Then not only that, but we see the next line. It says, and their knowledge of the truth, 
which accords with godliness. So he's writing so that they can hear the truth and believe, but he's also writing so that they can grow in the truth and be built up. That's why we use the word edification. Have you ever heard of the word of an edifice? You know, I remember that one time um, my brother built a huge swing in the backyard for his kids, for grace and for glory. And I just couldn't believe it. I went, I went, went out in their backyard, and the thing was like past every regulation known to man. It goes way, you gotta know my brother. I mean, it's hysterical, you know, he's like, well, if we're gonna build a sing, swing, we ought to build a swing. And I just walked out there, and he was barbecuing, and I, you know, we were coming over to eat. I just walk out there, and I go, what is that edifice? You know, I was like, I, the, the chains weren't on it yet or whatever. It was like 15 or 20 feet tall. I was like, somebody's going to get killed on that thing. But I, I just remember thinking, what is he building in the backyard? And it got very elaborate, and it was kind of cool. Now, I think that Joe Colonna has topped it. I, I saw... Um, the one that Joe has built in the backyard. It looks like a, a jungle gym. But, the, you know, we, when we build something, we're, we're creating. We are in an edifice right now. This has been, what do you do with an edifice? You erect an edifice. You build it. Um, and so what we see Paul is saying here is, I'm writing so that people will believe the gospel, God's elect will believe the gospel, and their knowledge of the truth so that they can be built up we, how, do you, how are you built up in being in a lost and fall, fallen world? You're built up by knowing the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you, make you free. We see throughout the Scripture that when we come to um, that which is false and we come to that which is not true, we need to know the truth, and that is what we see over and over and over again, that Jesus is talking about the importance of telling the truth, teaching the truth, and we see Paul and Peter, we see all of the other writers of the New Testament, their concern is that God's people would have the truth and be built up in the truth. This is why you need to study the Bible, not just here on Sunday morning. This is why you need to study the Bible in your home. You need to read the Bible. You need to come become familiar with the Bible. And you know what? I know it's a big book. I know that there's a lot there, but there's all kinds of ways to help you become a student of God's Word and hear what the Creator has said. Not only, it, it, the amazing thing is if you just have a Bible and you have the Holy Spirit and you have some Christians around you, you can grow magnificently you can grow in the knowledge of God's Word simply by reading the Bible. You don't have to read Wayne Glutem's 800-page systematic theology. You, you don't have to have that. It's helpful. I use it. There's other books that I use that are useful. But you know what the best commentary on the Bible is? The Bible. The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Can you say that with me? The best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. One of the greatest ways to come to understand the Bible is by reading it and seeing it. And as one area seems to not make sense for a moment or for a while, as you've read other things, the Holy Spirit uses that to bring you into a broader and broader and broader understanding of what he's done. Just spend time in his word. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit uses that. Um, but I, I want you to see that that's what it means to be built up in the truth. So Paul writes, if you haven't filled it in already, Paul writes to build them up in God's truth. He's writing so that they would have knowledge of the truth. Now notice here with me that God's truth is inseparably linked to godly living. If you really have God's truth, and if God's truth has transformed your heart, your life is going to show it. Now, I want you to notice this. Look at the passage that is there next to number two. Edification, and then look at the passage. In fact, let's read those italicized words out loud together where it says, and their knowledge, okay? Let's read that. Here we go. And their knowledge of the truth which accords... Yeah. Their knowledge of the truth, circle the word accords... Now, this is the idea of a cord. This is the idea of a cord with strands that go together. And those strands that go together make it strong. They're, they're bound together. And so, if you're in a cord with something, that means that you're bound with it. That means that you're together with it. 
And so here is the knowledge of the truth that, that, that you're going to build your life on, and what Paul is saying to us is, this affects the way you live. It affects your godliness. It affects godly living. So if you truly have the truth, your life is going to show it. If you truly have the grace of God moving and working in your life, your life is going to be different. And that's what Paul is hammering at for the Cretans. He's saying, look, the island of Crete is a very ungodly place, but you have the truth. And the truth means that you don't live like the rest of the culture around you. The truth means that you honor God. You live for God. So when this life is over, you're ready to meet God. God does that in us, calling us to himself. You know, there's a lot of people, I'll just say, there's a lot of people that just, they kind of like the idea of Christianity. They kind of like coming to church, makes them feel good. Some people come and they say, every time I go, I feel miserable. I, you know, I don't know what it is. Well, you know, that may just be God's gracious, loving conviction on you that you need, to, you need to surrender to him. You need to believe upon him. Don't go away sad and mad. Just come and respond to God's call in your life. Respond to the gospel. Respond in the call to believe and to see that God is good. Let me tell you that we're, we're often so worried about what God's going to take away when we ignore what all he has given He's given himself. That's what this table is about. This table has bread, and this table has the fruit of the vine, and both of those things represent the body and life of God given for you. What more can he give? He gives himself. And yet some say, well, that's not enough. Well, I still like this world. My friends, if you live in love with the world, then you will have the same fate as the world, which is being cut off from God. The reason for this table is so we don't have to be cut off from God. The reason for this table is so that we can be united with God, that we can come and be one with God. John chapter 17 describes that beautiful unity that Christ has with the Father and that he offers for us to have with him. And so the edification is that truth and godly living are linked and separately. There's a, there's a third thing that, it, that is here, and I want you to see um, the scripture out to the side of number three, and I'm gonna ask you to read it out loud with me. Look what it says. It starts with in hope. Let's don't do it twice, so everybody read. Clear your throat. <clears> there <throat> you go. Let's read in hope. Read it strong. Here we go in hope of eternal life, which God promised before the ages began. Would you circle those words, in hope of eternal life? This is a beautiful purpose that Paul is writing to Titus. And it's a beautiful purpose for which he is writing to us. That it's not only so that you can believe and so that you can be built up in the truth, but look at this, you can be encouraged. You can be encouraged that the end result of all of this is eternal life. Now, that's a glorious thing. That's a whole lot better than living for the here and now. The here and now is short. Have you ever noticed that the older you get, the faster time flies? Now, the young people in this room, you guys, you just don't understand that. Trust me. You don't, I know you're thinking, if I ever could get out of middle school, I would be very happy. Or if I ever could get out of, out of high school, you know, everything goes so slow, this is taking so long, come on, I want to grow up. But the first thing I'm going to say is relax, enjoy what God is getting, get, enjoy the time, right? You hear all these people going amen? If you agree with that, would you say amen? amen. Stop being all stressed, tr- stop trying to, now, that doesn't mean be irresponsible, That doesn't mean be so sedentary that your mother has to dust you like she does the furniture. Don't don't do that. But, you know, it's so often, well, when can I wear makeup? Well, when can I do this? When can I drive? When can I go out on my own? When can I do all that? I just want to, I just, you know, as children, we so often want to be bigger than where we are instead of savor the moment. Now, again, in this day and time, I have to say, don't settle down to not growing and maturing. We have a big problem with that in our society as well. 
But we need to see that God has an encouragement for us that this life is short and eternity is long. And if we have the promises of Christ for eternity, we have everything to look forward to in this new life. I mean, Mrs. Betty Campbell, I was with her um, two nights ago, uh, two afternoons ago with Pastor Lucas and Tommy, and we were sitting there just listening to her, and she was so quick to speak of her trust in the Lord. She just looked at me as soon as I walked in. She said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go, but I'd kind of like to stay. Um, I'm really ready to go. And I mean, she really means that. She's She's convinced more than her physical presence in this moment. She's convinced more of that. She is convinced of the Savior's love for her. And I just, I believe that about her. I've known her for a long time, and I've always been encouraged by her. There's so many things that she's been through. I mean, she's been through some real tragedies. And at every turn, while there's tears, while there's hardships, while there's disillusionment, she has loved the Savior, and she's loved her church. <coughs> Ne'er a negative word out of her mouth. An amazing woman. I got a text last night from a friend, and he said, hey, does so-and-so go to your church? I said, yeah, he does. He said, check this out. He said, I was just with him, and we were talking a little bit, and I asked about um, just something in his life, and his, his countenance fell, and it had to do with his kids, and he said, that's really hard. He said, we're struggling as parents with our kids, and we're, we're heartbroken over that. And um, he said, you know, it's, it's really hard, but he said, we keep trusting in the Lord, and listen to this, and we can't wait for Sundays. We keep trusting in the Lord, and we can't wait for Sundays. We can't wait to be here. We can't wait to be reminded of the truth. We can't wait to re be reminded that there's the hope of eternal life in a fallen world that's messed up with sin and filled with sickness and filled with death and filled with pain. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is the beauty of God saying, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, the pain of this world is heavy load. But the joy of coming to the one who died for our sins and promises to us eternal life is a glorious truth. Notice this. So Paul is writing to them to show and remind them of our glorious future with God. You know, there's a lot of time. Don't flip your sheet yet. Just, just look, look at those words. Our glorious future with God. There's a lot of times when we need to be reminded through the troubles and the hardships of this life that God has given us a glorious future in Christ. Well, there's this phrase. Look at the top of your page where it says our verse, and um, it's on the back side. You can see that. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of, circle these two words, God's elect. God's elect. Right here at the beginning of this letter is this bold statement about God's plan and God's sovereignty and God's work in our lives. And he says when he's referring to Christians, he's calling them, these are the ones that God has chosen. These are the ones that God has called out of the darkness. They've heard his voice and they've responded to his voice in his grace. This is about God's elect. That's the, the picture of this entire letter, and it's one of the most glorious truths of all of Scripture. Notice here with me, for the sake of God's elect, that's what it is. That's what he's talking about. You see, the Bible, fill this in, is saturated. It is absolutely saturated with God's grace-filled, fill that in, grace-filled election and choosing of his people. 
When you start in Genesis and you move all the way through the Bible, you see God's beautiful, sovereign plan in motion. And he is the one who calls his children to him. He chooses them out of the darkness. He chooses them out of this hardship. And I, I just want you to see several passages that are here, and we're going to look at these, God's election in the Old Testament and God's election in the New Testament. And let me just tell you that this is about one-fiftieth of the verses that are very blatant, not to mention the thousands of verses that are in an indirect way speaking of God's election of his children. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 7. So this is way back in the Torah. This is all the way back at the beginning. This is the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is it back at the beginning, and look what it says. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. Above the word holy, right, set apart. Not like the rest. So you're a holy people. You're not like all the other peoples. God has a plan. He says, for you, a you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. You see it right there, the word chosen. He, he's chosen you out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So it's not he's chosen you to people, be a people for his own possession as opposed to the deer and the antelope and the you know, amoebas and the bacteria. No, no, no. This is, this is talking about he is choosing you out of the people, out of the other nations of the world. The reality of God's choice. Look at Psalm 135, verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob. The Lord has chosen Jacob himself, for himself, Israel for his own possession. You see, God chooses out individuals and nations for his glory. Look at Isaiah 65, verse 1. This, this isn't that they were choosing him. Look at Isaiah 65, verse 1. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. Wow. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. Here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. We see in Isaiah this broad picture toward the end of Isaiah, just before the new heaven and the new earth is announced by Isaiah, that he's saying that all of you, not just the nation of Israel, but anyone who comes to God, you didn't seek me. And the Lord was saying, here I am, here I am, revealing himself beautifully, lovingly, calling us. Now, possibly one of the most mind-blowing passages in the New Testament is John chapter 15. I love the whole chapter of John 15, but look at this with me. John 15 and verse 16, Jesus is the one speaking, and look what he says. He just looks at the people, and he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask, the name, ask the Father in my name, may be given to you. He's just making very clear right from the get-go. I mean, he's saying, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. This is a theme that we see throughout Jesus' teaching. This is a theme that we see throughout um, the New Testament. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, perhaps one of the most beautiful, ornate um, pictures of what God does in his people. Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3 show our position in Christ. But right at the beginning of Ephesians, in verse 3, right after the introduction, he, this is how he starts the letter in verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see, this is a giving God. You're worried about Jesus taking something away from you? He's get, if, you're in, if you're a Christian, he has given you everything in the heavenly places. This is an amazing, amazing reality. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Look at all the language here of God saying, here you are on the, on the auction block of slavery. 
Here you are, bound in your sin. Here you are, bound in all of humanity's rebellion against God. And God shows up to the auction and said, I want that one. That's mine. And he, and he pays the price. And he doesn't just take out cash and pay. He doesn't just give a kingdom and pay. He comes and he gives his own son and he pays. You see, this is, this is the glorious grace of God. Look at that at the end of the part where it's underlined. It says, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Circle the word grace. That's where it comes from. That's where his, his grace comes from. It's, it's not because the one on the block had any inherent value other than God's grace upon him with which he has blessed us in the beloved. That's in Jesus. Verse 7, in him we have redemption. That's being bought. That's being bought back from sin. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Oh, the glorious picture of a God that doesn't have to save anyone, but chooses to save some. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Now, there's two things that save you. I want you to see this. It is the sanctification by the Spirit, circle the word spirit, and belief in the truth. This is why John over and over and over again in his gospel says these things have been written so that you can believe. Jesus keeps talking about the fact that you need to believe that he is indeed the savior of the world, that he would die for your sins and rise again, that this is what it means to believe unto faith, to believe in the truth. So that's, that's the evidence of it and how that is played out. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Peter is writing to Christians in the first century, and he says, but you are a what? A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy, what does holy mean? Set apart, not like the rest. You're a special nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow, the glory of God coming and rescuing. Second Timothy also makes so clear, similarly to, to Ephesians 2, I want you to see this, that it's not about us, and it's not by our works, but it's all by his grace. Look at 2 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 1, 8. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, underline that, not because of our works, but because of his own what? Purpose, Purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. You see, this is God's sovereign plan. You can put out there to the side his grand plan. His grand plan is glorious, and it's before the ages began. Now, this, this is not something that I figured out. This is not something that some theologian figured out. This is not something that the reformers figured out. This goes back to the core of the eternal Word of God. Throughout the Bible, we see this picture of God calling out His children to Himself. Now, look at Romans chapter 9. No no message on the, uh, the doctrine of the election as an overview would be um, complete without looking at Romans 9, one of the key passages that shows us of this beautiful mercy and grace of God. Look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Mm. Look at verse 16. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, circle it, who has mercy. Now you can write out there to the side, 
it, and this is good for us to understand, God would be justified in not saving anyone. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone has turned to the Lord. I mean, everyone has turned to his own way. But that verse goes on to say, but God has laid on him, that is Jesus, the wrath and the condemnation and the judgment so that we might be free. Now, this picture that God would be just and not saving anyone, but notice this right in the middle of this chapter that is so key to this. It's talking about mercy. It's talking about compassion. It's talking about this picture of God's grace that calls us to himself. Well, this is only a small picture, and as we come to the table in just a moment, I... I want you to be thinking about, if you're a Christian, why me? Why would I know this truth? Why would he choose to put me in that family? Or why would he choose to put me in that office? Why would he? There's so many thousands, millions, around us. And we see in the scripture that narrow is the way that leads to life. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Many, there's, there's not going to be many saved. It's going to be very narrow. If it's very narrow and if there's very few, how did I wind up hearing the gospel in God's grace? Friends, I just want you to see that this is part of the effectual calling of God that he comes and he puts his children in the place to see and to hear the truth and he even grants to them the grace of belief and faith notice this God's election is better humbly accepted than proudly resisted and this would be true for those who have never been saved that you hear God's voice calling you, you see that he's been working in your life, you're hearing that a Savior has died, somehow you've wound up in this place, or somehow you've clicked on this message, or somehow you're living next to someone who's sharing this truth with you, the best thing that you can do is latch on and believe the message that you're hearing. And if you have the grace to hear the message of God, you can rejoice and say, God, in his grace, has died for my sin. Now, there's some who will proudly resist that. They will say, well, what about me? What about what I do? We look at our own inherent quality and we think, well, it must have something to do with me. It must be that I didn't do that event that I remember back. I resisted temptation 30 years ago, and I didn't do that. God must like me, or I'm not like my brother, or I'm not like somebody else. At least I, I must be better than, than some no, that's, that's pride. But for Christians as well, it's better for Christians to humbly accept the beautiful doctrine of election than to sit there and think that they figured it out. To think that somehow there was some inherent thing in me that figured it out when the Bible over and over and over again says just the contrary. Jesus himself says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Oh, the beautiful picture of his grace. Notice this. As we close, I want you to see this. For God's children, an attitude of gratitude should flood our heart at the cross and at his table. When we see the cross, when we contemplate the cross, when we think about the cross, and I'm not just talking about two cross beams nailed together. I'm talking about what was nailed to that cross. That the second person of the Trinity, the eternal creator God, came and he was stretched out on a cross. He was nailed to a cross for our sins. And he says, let me show you how much I love you. This is how much I love you. Oh, the beauty 
of the cross. And, and the fact that he tells us what the cross means through the table of the Lord.